Um, so you guys have these in your folder, these progressions. Um, it shows us you, our course offerings. You have the standard one, which are really the minimum requirements needed to graduate from here with a college prep high school diploma. And then our more rigorous option that really is looking to um, go above and beyond the CBA graduation requirements and looking at if you are looking to apply to some elite colleges, sort of what you would need to do to, you know, make your resume as strong as possible. Um, reality is uh, all these courses here in these little bubbles are, if you go to our website, gocba.com, there is, you can click on the curriculum and you can get more of a description of each course. Um, I'll touch on this in a minute. Shelly's going to talk a little bit about, we have these two progressions. It's not that kids do one or the other typically. It's usually a mix and sort of how we sort of individualize that per student. So I'm Shelly Koenig. Um, I am sort of the, the director of facilitating communication between the homeschool and CBA, director of student planning. And um, you know, as Karen said, really the reality is most of our students take a course progression that's a little bit of a mix between the standard college preparatory curriculum and the, the uh, more advanced uh, schedule that Karen had up a second ago. Um, so really what we try to do at CVA is we work with each kid, with each family, and unlike a public school, we also include the coaches in on these discussions to help try and create a program for each student that's individualized based on their goals. So some of our students, their you know, athletic goals are going to be a, a very large part of their academic program when we make the decisions of what courses are going to be the best progression. Um, we've been working with kids and families over the last really over the last year or two specifically, to start looking at a long-range program rather than just one year at a time. What sorts of colleges are kids looking at going into? What sorts of athletic goals do they have? And what course progressions can we use to help get them to those goals? And every year we reevaluate to try to keep as many doors open for our students as we can. Okay. Um, these course progressions, interesting, um, when we send college transcripts to different admissions offices, they also get sort of what courses we offer so they sort of see what the student has taken and what we offer and you know be able to sort of rank them as far as you know are they taking rigorous course offerings or are they not sort of challenging themselves or or they are doing you know as best they can so those do go to the colleges as well the most rigor both um, course progressions have different options you'll see here with science, math, language, and a lot of that is just it depends on where they come, what they come in with, what they did in middle school, or if they started in a different high school where they came in with. Doesn't mean we can't slide them into different things. It might mean here to get to the say most to do honors calculus, and maybe they started with pre-algebra as a ninth grader. It means they'd have to double up on one of their math at some math at some point in time. Um, but it is definitely achievable, and it really sort of depends on what they did in middle school or another high school. Uh, but you can see we sort of have the standard progression. These are our middle school classes and then our high school classes um, with biology, chemistry, two years of biology, physics, all lab sciences. We also have environmental science. Um, you can see that for language we offer um, French and Spanish. And one thing that, a question that we often get with our really small class sizes is whether or not we do honors courses. Um, we do honors courses in many of our courses, and what we do is we actually do a lot of our honors courses with a heterogeneous grouping. So while you may still come to period five chemistry, there may be some students in the class that are taking an honors level chemistry at the same time with other kids that are taking a college prep chemistry. And the expectations for that student are a little bit different, the assessments are a little bit different, but we do it within that grouping so it's possible for kids to pursue their interests in some specific subjects. And just the last thing I wanted to address here is these are not CBA graduation requirements, but these are what you should be doing if you are going to be applying to elite colleges. This is sort of what they're looking for above and beyond a typical high school graduation requirement. I'm going to go to the schedule. So this is our fall schedule. And I know probably you can't read most of what it says from where you're sitting in the back of the room, but one of the things that you can see is the pink represents academic time. So if you look at the academic time that we have during the fall schedule, it's pretty heavy in terms of the student's day. They're spending most of their time in academics. There is an athletic block in the morning that the coaches use for a lot of the physical training. And then in the afternoon is also another block for athletics. And then sometimes they might use those blocks to play sports or also work on some of the human performance. So our academics are Monday through Saturday during the fall. 
And then, Karen, if you want to. And then this is our winter time schedule, which is the schedule that we're on right now. You'll notice that we don't have Saturday classes in the winter. Um, most of the students' competitions tend to be on the weekend, particularly for the younger kids. So we've moved, we move away from the Saturday academics. And the athletic blocks, you'll notice, are larger blocks. So the kids can go up on the hill. The prime snow tends to be in the morning. So we use the morning chunk for our training, especially in December and January. If any of you guys know Sugarloaf, you know that's where the best light is. And then the academic time in the, during the winter is in the afternoons. So we are in class until about 5.15 most days. The only real exception to that is our Mondays. We do start our academic time mid-morning so that all teachers have a chance to meet with, every, with all of their students. Every class meets on Mondays, which is a great touch base after weekends, especially when students have been traveling. And then Karen, if you wouldn't mind, bring it to a packet. The other thing that I'd like to talk to you about is a little bit about how we do school for students that are traveling. I know that's a big question. You have kids that are on the road very frequently. How do they meet the same objectives if they're not in the classroom? And the reality is, is that a lot of our kids do miss a large number of days, especially our older kids, because they have competitions during the weekdays, not just on the weekends. And so this is just an example. I just pulled up one of my chemistry. I teach chemistry. So this is one of my chemistry packets. And what we do is we create a curriculum. Each teacher creates a curriculum for students that allow them to keep up with their classes while they're traveling. Rather than playing the catch-up game, what did I miss when we get back, the expectation is that our kids take their programs with them when they travel. So this particular stoichiometry packet, you'll notice, is sort of a multimedia packet. Um, it includes some YouTube links. These are actually, I won't show them to you, but these are actually videos of me teaching class that I've posted to YouTube so that they can actually see the class lessons. Um, I know several teachers use their own, their own YouTube videos. There's some teachers that also have some great resources that have been made by other teachers that are out on the internet. And then in addition, my notes are also included in this packet. These are just a click away. Um, I have some worksheets with some answer keys in here. So there's a lot of interactive ways that the kids can access information from these packets. And what they do is we have a program called eBackpack that we use that shows kids when their work is due, and we use that program and some other technological devices as well that allow us to communicate with the kids while they're traveling. So the expectation is if you have a question about something, that you reach out to your teachers, you ask the question, and we'll, you know, we'll communicate back if we need to FaceTime or have a Skype session. We've been doing that with students frequently. And it allows us the opportunity to keep moving forward rather than, well, we'll wait, and when we get back, we'll ask all of these questions. Because as a lot of you know about travel schedules, some of them are pretty rigid and they're back out on the road quickly thereafter. So we want to make sure that our students can come back into the classroom and know what we've been doing. It might be that we don't meet the objective the same way. It might not be the exact same exercise. It might not be the exact same activity. But it will meet the same objective. So when the kids return to the classroom, they have that same content. Karen, did you want to add anything else about travel packets? Um, no, just what Shelley said. It's really the expectation is that when they are traveling, especially for really extended trips, like two, three weeks, that we are touching base with them regularly. They're submitting their work. They're not just making up the work when they get back. And that we're communicating if we're not getting work, and that's when we communicate with the coach, and the coaches and teachers have a good relationship, um, really you know, making sure the kids are doing what they need to be doing. Yeah. So I know when Karen introduced herself, she said she'd been here for 16 years. Which, yeah. 17, which means I've been here for 16 years. Yeah. Um, so Karen and I have been doing this for a really long time. Um, and so we really wanted to give you the opportunity to ask questions to a couple of teachers that you know have been, have been working with this program for a long time and what does work and what doesn't work. So I would love to turn it over to you guys and see if there's any questions we can talk about. Wow, you guys are an easy bunch. <laughs> you guys have a lot of postgraduate students. Oh, great question. We do have PG students. Um, a lot. What do you have, Kate? Like nine or ten right now? Well, usually anywhere between six and twelve on any particular year. And and some of our PG students take classes. Mm -hmm. Some of our PG students take some college classes online. And then some of our PG students are focused on, entirely on their athletics. So it really depends on you know what the students' goals are. Are they looking to get some more high school courses before moving on to college, or are they looking to spend one more year really refining their sport before mm -hmm. moving on to whatever might be after? Okay. So yes okay. is the answer to your question. Are you looking at a PG? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Great. 
Uh, Karen, yeah. How many classes are they taking at a time? And then the other question I want to ask is, I know from experience, you're very busy during the day mm -hmm. in terms of your training and your skiing when you're traveling. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff that you need to do, ski prep and all that. How do you? How are they fitting in? Is it, are they, is it, how do they fit it all in? And Great question. <laughs> and actually, um, the schedule did, <laughs> just went away. I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> so if you look at the schedule and yeah, parent can scroll. So we have seven. I'm going to the winter. Sorry, I'm going to the winter. We schedule. have seven periods that rotate throughout the day. The period seven class period, we call that a flex period. Most of the kids during the winter time don't have a class during period seven. It's usually an opportunity for kids to come meet with teachers, get extra help. Sometimes we have extra programs that run during the period seven. So I wouldn't call that an academic class. Generally speaking, most of our students also have one prep period that rotates through the schedule. So in a six, six period schedule, most of our kids take five classes. So for most students on, the, on both the college prep and also the, the um, other schedule that Karen had up, most kids would take a language, an English class, a history class, a math, and a science class, and that would be the five. Yeah, and sometimes, occasionally, a kid will take six classes, but we really look closely at that because we wouldn't recommend that to, right. for many students. And again, that's part of the individualization. Yep. You know, there might be some kids that can afford to take an extra academic class during the year, but another student might have a travel schedule that would really suggest that that might not be the best idea that they should have a study hall to hold it in. Mm -hmm. In terms of when did they get it all done, it's a great question, and the answer to that question is that our kids learn how to be incredibly efficient with time management. It's a necessity based on the schedule that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look around the dinner hour, you know, the dinner hour goes from 5.30 to, depending on which, when they want to start study hall, mandatory study hall starts at 7.30, two hours is a big window to eat dinner. So a lot of kids use some of that time for academics. We do have an early study hall support session so that if they want to come in early for academics, 6.15 to 7.15, they can come in and get help from a teacher. There's someone available. There's a quiet study for that before the mandatory study hall begins. But another student might choose to use that time to tune their skis. Or they might choose to use that time to hang out with friends. You know, that's sort of a flex time that they can use. And then after study hall is sort of social time for most kids, but it certainly can be a catch-up opportunity. What about on the road? On the road. That's what I'm thinking about on the road. How great question. That? You know, the coaches will do the best they can to try to mimic the evening opportunity for study hall sometimes. And Jesse might be a great person to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, sometimes mean, they have to be flexible. Yeah, you, usually you're three to four hours, though, no mm -hmm. problem by every day. You know, but it, as long as you're not on competitions traveling too far, but three to four hours, you know, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then a day off once a week where it's pretty much just all day, you know, we're off snow. Because we like to go four on and then take a day off when we're traveling, just so it doesn't get too much. So they get plenty of academic time, and their ability to advocate for themselves and get more time and do that is, I mean, it's really what we're looking at putting our kid here. You know, the students are just so good at getting their own things done and knowing what they need. And you know, Jesse brings up a really great point. Another piece about that that we really work with the kids to learn how to do is to advocate and communicate. You know, so for example. You know, if some kids have gone to a competition, and let's say I have a chemistry assignment that's due on Friday, and maybe on Thursday and Friday of that week are their competitions, and they have some really big, important competitions. It's just, you know, it's a matter of the student letting the teacher know, hey, you know, I'm racing on Thursday and Friday. Could I hand in that lab report on Sunday? And absolutely, we can accommodate that. The kids learn to communicate, and the teachers are all very flexible in accommodating, while another student that might be traveling on a different program might be able to hand that work in on Thursday or Friday because they're training those days as opposed to competing on those days. So it's about communication and about a little bit of individualization. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Maybe just touch on academic assistance and when students need a little extra help, how that works. Yeah. Yeah, so again, the early, the early help sessions for a lot of kids are great opportunities for kids that just need a little bit of extra help. They want to come in and, and have a little adult interaction while they're working on their math. It's a great time for them to come in and just to ask some questions. We also do have an academic assistance program. Um, so for kids that need a little bit more formal assistance, we do have some tutors that they can hire to, to work. Some need one hour a week. Some kids ask for more than that. And those tutors can be available most of the time during the study hall hours, but we do have some tutors that can be flexible and available during the school day as well. So depending on what the students' needs are, um, that's definitely a resource that is available to them all.
Yeah. And the other thing we did this year, Karen, sorry, getting back to your question, on some of the bigger trips that we've had, the two or three week chunks, that we have sent uh, academic staff a teacher on the trip to help mm -hmm. facilitate study hall, help the coaches out. They had a really long day. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely uh, been working well. Yeah. And just w real quickly, um, a little bit more on CBS College Counseling Program. We have uh, Andy Lyons is our college counselor, um, and she works heavily with, uh, really starting with the sophomores with PSATs, actually all the students with PSATs, um, and meets individually with the juniors and the seniors as they're going through the college application process. And she uses a program called Naviance, which uh, a lot of public schools also use, so if they, there's an account set up already, she can get into that, and um, that will have all their sort of background on the courses they've taken, their transcripts, the colleges they want to apply to. Um, but we have the best of full-time college counselor and stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. How about, do the students work to, like in groups for projects, or is it mostly That's a great question. Because people are doing you know, I mean, I, I can speak from my experience. I've worked with the 8th grade, the ninth grade, and then also with the 11th grade. And I've definitely found it's easier with the 8th and ninth grade to do more group projects because the kids primarily travel on the weekends. With the, some of the older kids, that can be more challenging. And then sometimes there are teams that might, I might have two or three students that are on a team that does create an opportunity for projects. So I guess the answer to your question is we do a little bit of both. You know, when it, when it makes sense, to embrace a project that's a group project, that there's there's a huge value to that. In the fall and in the spring, that's really easy for us to access. In the winter time, you don't want to set a student up for failure. You don't want to have them be that partner that can't be there to be part of the group. So we're mindful of that when we do set those things up. You know, if we know that some kids are going to be traveling, we might set up groups differently or have it be an individual project during those winter months when they're not a lot. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys for coming. This is a far better turnout than I expected. Uh, my name is Carter Witherspoon, and I'd like to welcome you to the college admission process, what you need to know from an insider's perspective. I am a CBA alum. I graduated in 2002. I presently live in Boston and drove up to for the day to be here with you guys. Um, this is the first such panel that we've had here at CBA, and hopefully it's the first of many. Joining us today, we've got three panelists, esteemed panelists. We have Dr. Arthur Pierce at the end, Sam Pelletier here in the middle, and we have Julia Savage. Uh, Dr. Pierce is a Dartmouth College alum who lives in Carabasset Valley. He's superintendent of the Belfast School System for many years, and he currently conducts area admission interviews for Dartmouth. He's here today to share his insights regarding what he considers a successful interview and to offer some tips to help you prepare and practice so that as a student you are able to present your best self to interviewers. Sam Pelletier is a CBA alum class of 2005 and he currently works as Assistant Director of Admissions at Colby College. Sam will share tips on how to make an application stand out to admissions offices. Sam also is a graduate of Colby College class of 2009. And then last but not least we have Julia who is a CBA alum from the class of 2012 and is currently a senior at Bates College. She will share some insight on what it's like as a CBA student to go through the application process, and she will also share how the rigor of the sports academy lifestyle translates into success in college life. So basically, in the next hour, for many of you, you know, the most important decision of your life to date is where you're gonna to go to college. So in the next hour, our goal is to provide you with an insider's perspective based on these esteemed panelists' insider knowledge. Each of our panelists is going to have 10 minutes to share his or her knowledge with us, and then we'll have a 20-minute question and answer period at the end. So we ask that each of you guys hold your questions, if possible, until the end of the 10-minute uh, the session. We have paper and pens floating around, so you guys are happy to you know, write stuff down if you have questions that come up so you don't forget them. Um, so with that, without further ado, we'll start with you, Dr. Pierce. Uh, please tell us about what you do for Dartmouth and what you're looking for in an interview and what kind of information you're reporting back to Dartmouth at the conclusion. <clears throat> I'm not only a Dartmouth grad, but I also lived in Hanover, home of Dartmouth College. 
for a few years while being superintendent of schools. So I've seen it from both, both sides. Dartmouth may be unusual, but I think there are a few other colleges that rely exclusively on alumni to interview candidates. And you go to colleges such as Dartmouth and during your vacations and have a tour of the campus with undergraduates. Great thing to do, do it. But if you want to interview, you can put up with people like me. Hopefully you get people that are recent graduates, because that way you can ask them questions about what it's really like on campus today. In my case, it gets a little bit filtered that I will say, oh, you need to talk to somebody who's a recent graduate or going to get somebody who's there today. But nonetheless, part of the interview process should be you initiating questions, not just the interviewer asking the questions. And the real underlying principle is that you are a salesperson. Who are you marketing? What's your product you're mar marketing? Yourself. Yeah, yourself. It's your chance to put your best foot or feet forward. In the case of Dartmouth, the admissions officers look at the applications and all the material that comes in associated with them and put people in sort of a ranked order. Those that really look like we want to admit them, those that clearly aren't qualified and a whole bunch in the middle. They look at the reports from the interview only after they've done that much work. And then it's the interview that sort of fleshes out you as a real person beyond what shows up uh, from the computer or the paperwork that you have submitted. The interviews can be in conducted here at your school or I have people in the surrounding area within about an hour's drive of here that would uh, arrange to have me interview them uh, up on the mountain. And that's always fun at John Joe's or Ellie's. And, uh, they get permission from the guidance counselor to uh, leave school that morning or not come to school at all and meet me on the mountain. We have an hour's interview and then they go out and still go or ski and uh, that works for all of us. But again, I say this because it's showing me something about the candidate, how you initiate the arrangements, how serious you are, how creative you are. Now, one thing the interviewer isn't interested in at all is your grades, where other schools you're considering, um, none of that. We're interested in you as a person. So don't come to the list of all the stuff you've already given the college. On the other hand, what is a really good technique is to come with a resume in your hand. I interviewed one of your uh, fellow students this year. Came in with a very nice resume. You can talk from that. It gave me some highlights for that candidate that then we could flesh out talking in the conversation to come. Incidentally, the conversation together. The college advises we alums that we should plan on a half hour, 45 minutes of interview. I find mine tend to run longer. I did two people down on the coast this year, lasted two hours. Because we got in a wonderful dialogue about the engineering project that one of them was in and another special project the other one was in. And it was just a conversation as though I'd known the people forever. I'd never seen them before and probably won't see them again. So, You've got to be prepared for any kind of dynamic. As a footnote, I was at supper last night and someone commented that an interview they'd had with a Dartmouth alum some years ago uh, didn't go well. I think my reading of it is that the alum was on a different wavelength than the candidate. And if something like that should happen, I'd say go speak to your advisor here at school see whether you and the advisor think it would be worth your while to have the advisor contact the admissions office. You might be able to give us some advice on that. Say, hey, we had an interview, something didn't click here, maybe could you assign a different person to do the same thing? I would, frankly, if that happened, if I was the one that didn't connect with you, I would appreciate it if you did feedback that way, so you would have an equal opportunity chance of uh, correcting that. Efficiency on my part. 
I hand it out to you uh, the questions which are given to alumni. Uh, I don't go down that whole list. I've done this enough years so I sort of have my own pattern. But what I do do in almost every instance is I give that list out. I tell the person at the beginning of the that I'm going to do it. And toward the end of the interview, I do hand it out. And I say, take your time, work, walk your way down through this list. Is there anything on there or things on, multiple things on there, that you would have liked to have covered? If so, feel free. And that usually elicits a couple of additional questions. If it doesn't, then that's sort of a flag to me that the person may not be as serious as I wish they were. So if that's an opportunity given, I would say don't take advantage of that. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's also an opportunity for you to ask questions about the college. You shouldn't be asking the questions, the answers to which you already know, or that are available to you on the website. I think virtually every college today has a good website, certainly Dartmouth does, and you can get all kinds of questions answered there. But if you've got a specific question, how does the Dartmouth D plan, which is four semesters, and you must take one summer on campus, and you are encouraged to take some semesters off campus, how does that fit with my ski schedule? How does that fit with this snowboarding scene? And those are important questions that you could discuss during the interview. And if in my case I don't have the specifics, at least we can say how you might go find the answer to that question. Now, I report the interview to the college electronically, usually the same day that the interview takes place. And there's four areas that I list. One is intellectual engagement and curiosity. What is that? Well, kind of college, it means you're Demonstrated intellectual engagement, i.e. curiosity, academic experiences that have impacted your thinking, love of learning, creativity, and so forth and so on. I'm supposed to cite specific examples from our conversation, other than rank and class and all that, to support my observations. So you need to feed me specific examples of something that you've done that demonstrate your curiosity. Similarly, questions dealing with your commitment and personal motivations. Uh, talking about your work with the um, Special Olympics, which I know many of you do. Have you done a particular job or relative low students? And what have you taken a leadership position in that? Uh, summary analysis. How does this student compare? potential Dartmouth graduates. So I'm always comparing them to the other people that I did. What transpired during the meeting that most justifies my summary rating? So I have to have specific examples of what you said in order to justify my rating. And I have to rate one of the six categories from outstanding to not recommended and everything in between. That's the most challenging part of it for me. I will quit there and we'll take the questions you may have at the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Pierce. <laughs>
And in the spring, we work really hard to uh, yield the students that we've admitted. So once we uh, send out admission decisions, um, we then work really hard to make sure that uh, as many students as uh, we can get will take us up on those offers. And in the summertime, we, uh, again, we're recruiting students, we're doing interviews, uh, we're traveling around and meeting students, um, doing events like this, so on and so forth. Um, to, the college admissions process uh, can be a little stressful, um, and there's a lot of pressure on students and parents, so let me relieve some of that pressure right off the bat. Carter said earlier that this is the most important decision you will have made in your life at this point. Well, going to college uh, is an important decision. Um, every single one of the students in here is going to have the option to go to college. And you're all going to have a lot of options uh, to go to a college that fits you, where you can be successful, and you're going to do well, and you're going to have a happy life no matter what college you go to. So first off, that's important to, to speak about. Um, I come from the world of selective college admissions, uh, meaning that at Colby, we only admit about 20 to 25 percent of the students who apply. There are colleges, uh, colleges and universities that admit 80, 90 percent of students that apply. Um, doesn't mean one's better or worse. Um, again, I'm talking about what's right for you as a student. Um, so that's probably the most important thing that uh, I can speak about in general in college admissions is that what the student should be looking for is a college or university that fits their needs, their interests, um, and their abilities. Um, so as you're looking into colleges, as you're starting to put a list together of colleges that you're interested in, the things you really need to be thinking about are um, what are your academic interests, right? What, what are the things you want to study? You might not know exactly what you're going to major in or what you're going to do for a career when you're in high school. I didn't know. But you should have a little, a, at least some idea of what type of academic environment you're looking for. You're looking for a really rigorous and challenging academic environment, or are you looking for a more relaxed academic environment? Um, what are the, the, the um, other things that are really important to you? Do you want to be in the mountains? Do you want to be in the city? Um, do you want access to uh, you know, greater diversity? Um, all of those things are, are important to, to fit. And then the community that you're going to find yourself in in college. Um, is that really important? Do you want to be living on campus? Do you want to be commuting to school? So all of these things are, are really important for you to think about. Um, again, speaking to my experience in selective college admissions, um, the, the application process and sort of the whole uh, admission process starting in, towards the end of your junior year through the time when you're submitting applications, um, I, can, I can give you guys some tips on uh, what you should be thinking about, what you can do leading up to that time. Um, so you guys are putting in the hard work right now. Uh, as students, whatever year you grade you're in, um, it, it's not never too early to be thinking about, uh, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say you should be thinking uh, about college admissions as a freshman and sophomore, but you should be thinking about working hard and being successful because that's going to determine what your options are as you're getting into your junior and senior years. Um, most schools uh, use the common application at this time, um, which is an easy way for you to fill out one application and submit it to a lot of different colleges. That's what we use, that's what most colleges use. Um, so how do you maximize the, the common application? How do you stand out? Um, the common application is comprised of several documents. You're going to submit high school transcripts, which is going to show the numbers, your grades, your classroom performance. You're going to submit SAT or ACT scores for the most part. Some schools do not require those test scores, but uh, many schools do. Um, so where you really are going to present yourself is in your personal statement or essay um, and in your list of activities and in the teacher and counselor recommendations. Um, at CBA, you guys uh, are, stand out as unique applicants because you're devoting so much time and energy to competing and training at a really high level. So you, you stand out immediately because of that. Um, so as you, when you're thinking about you know, your extracurriculars and things like that, you may not have the most well-rounded list of uh, activities and extracurriculars. That's just fine. If you spend 52 weeks a year spending 20, 30, 40 hours a week 
pursuing your passion and competing at a high level, that, that means a lot to college admissions. Um, that means that you're someone that has devoted an incredible amount of time and energy to one thing, um, and you're doing it at a high level. So that looks great. Personal statement or essay is a chance for you to share your personality, uh, share your personal experiences that wouldn't come through on the transcript and in the numbers. Okay? Uh, we get to evaluate your writing abilities, which is really important at a school like Colby. Uh, no matter what you study, uh, writing skills and communication skills are going to be paramount. So that's really important. But it also gives you a chance to, to express yourself, share a little bit about your personality. Again, that wouldn't come through in other parts of the application. Uh, the teacher recs, which are a little bit out of your hands, but uh, choose wisely. Um, and choose ask early and be grateful when you do get those letters. Uh, those are really, really helpful for us because they tell us what you bring to the classroom, um, what type of student you are, what you contribute to the classroom environment, how you collaborate with your peers, what your strengths are, um, and hopefully not a lot about what your weaknesses are. Um, so that's what the Common App uh, looks like to us. Um, at, at selective colleges like Colby, um, we review the applications in a holistic manner, meaning we really look at every piece uh, of, the, of each individual student, as opposed to um, some universities where are your grades, grades a certain level, are your scores a certain level, you're in. Um, at Colby, we really look at the individual, um, what you've achieved, what your experiences are, uh, what your academic interests are, all of these things. Uh, I would highly recommend, if available, to uh, do the interview. Um, it's another great way to share your personality, show a different side that wouldn't come through on the application, gives you a chance to ask questions and find out more information about the school. And uh, in addition, visit as many schools as you can. If you're interested in the school and you can get there, visit it, get an idea of what the campus is like, uh, ideally when the school's in session, so you can see student life in action. Um, that's huge. I can't stress that enough. Obviously, you can't get to every college across the country that you might be interested in, but um, try to make those try to make those uh, those visits. They can really be beneficial. Um, one last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is that um, financial aid uh, can really determine uh, where a family and student is going to look at colleges. Um, college tuition goes up and up and up every year. It's an astronomical fee at this point for at many, many institutions. Um, with that said, don't let the sticker price deter you from pursuing a, a school if you're really interested in it. Um, because financial aid uh, it varies from school to school, but there's a lot of it out there. Um, and if a school particularly gives need-based financial aid, um, which means they don't give merit scholarships, but they give financial aid based on your family um, family's ability to pay, uh, then you can go to a great school um, and know that you're going to be able to afford it. So the place to start if you're interested in financial aid, every college website has something called the net price calculator. Every single college has this on their website. And it gives you an estimate according to that school's uh, unique financial aid policy, gives you an estimate of what your family contribution would be. Um, so that's a great place to start before you start, you know, throwing schools off the list just because of the price tag. So start with the, that price calculator. Don't limit yourself um, uh, on, by price. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Before. Sam, just a quick question, and maybe Dr. Pierce can answer this as well. You mentioned, you know, when available an interview. If an interview is it common practice for every candidate to have an interview, or at what stage do you do that? And if not, is it common practice or should these guys request an interview? Yeah. I feel like it would help them. Sure. Every college does it a little bit differently. Um, some schools don't offer interviews. Some schools only offer alumni interviews to students who have already applied for admission. Um, at Colby, um, and I think this is typical of many schools, we offer admissions on campus to visitors uh, starting in your junior year into the fall of your senior year. Um, so it's going to depend on, on the school, but um, if there if it's available, I, I always highly recommend it, simply as a way to, to show your interest in the school, find out more information about the school, and to share some of those things that wouldn't pop up on the, the application. Um, 
with that said, we certainly know that uh, not all of our applicants are going to be able to get to Waterville, Maine. We have students applying and enrolling from all over the world. So we don't expect every student to, to interview. Um, so it's not, it, it's not something that if you don't do it, then you're, you know, you're going to lose your chance at, of a slot. It's not like that at all. But it is recommended. Thanks, Sam. And now Julia. So, kind of springboarding off of a little bit what Sam was saying. So, when I decided, I decided on a smaller liberal arts school. Um, that was the kind of criteria of the types of schools that I was going to be applying to. And um, first, I just tried to visit as many of them as possible. Um, and I think that if you can visit, and like Sam was saying, if you can visit when school's in session, and then even beyond that, if schools are offering overnight visits, um, it's a really good opportunity for high school students to get a feel of the community at the school, because I think that it does matter from school to school. Um, obviously, a lot of the smaller with large schools are gonna have similar type feels and communities, and some of the larger schools are gonna have similar type feels and communities, and, you're going to be living on campus versus off campus. And there are going to be those similarities, but there also are differences that I know made a difference for me when I decided to go to Bates. Um, so just trying to get to know uh, the students as best you can when you do those visits. Ask lots of questions on your tours. It's a really big, big thing because they have kind of their what they're going to say to you through the tour, it's like very scripted, but if you get the student at the college engaged, I know like the people that I know that work on the tours always want to talk more about their own experiences at college, which can be really helpful um, as you're deciding. So for me, when I was applying, I, I had a little bit of a unique situation because my senior year, I actually, I was concussed in my senior fall. Um, and so I tried to get to a lot of uh, the interviews but couldn't really do that at that time. So what I found was that if you're in a situation, and I know a lot of times with travel, being at CBA, you find yourself in these situations where um, you can't necessarily make the, the normal, like you can't interview when they're offering interviews and things like that. If you reach out to the school and you talk to them about it, um, oftentimes they're really open to helping you um, kind of make that up in a way. Um, use any alumni connections that you know of. It's huge. It was huge for me. It was a really big deciding factor for me in choosing Bates because there were a lot of um, Bates alums that were working at CVA or had connections to CVA that I had an opportunity to sit down and talk with. And um, their experiences helped me decide that it was the right place for me. Um, and kind of in terms of how CVA prepares you for college, it's really it's a really unbelievable like how prepared you will be to deal with situations that other kids just haven't experienced, aren't prepared to deal with. Um, and you can kind of lose sight of that during the application process. Um, and when you're at CBA, you can lose sight of that because you're surrounded by people that are all in, the sim all in a similar situation. Um, but you guys, you know, you've traveled all over the world, you have, had to deal with all of your classes when you weren't on campus to actually take them. And you can highlight that in your application, I think, in a way that's really beneficial. Um, because when you step out of the CBA bubble, you know, you are really unique individuals um, and will be very productive members of whatever college community you decide to attend. Um, so just highlight that, highlight the things that you've experienced here that set you apart, whether they be academic or athletic or community service based, um, whatever it is, just, just try to highlight that um, because they, they are pretty significant experiences that you've had. Um, and 
The other thing that I would say is, so I'm not a D1 skier at Bates, and so I went through, I don't really know what the path is like talking to a coach and going through that whole process, um, but I was able to meet with a professor uh, at Bates while I was applying, who then became my advisor and is now my thesis advisor. Um, and so if you're really interested in something, or if you maybe can't uh, ski D1 in college, or if you're not a racer, um, you know, you're pursuing a slightly different path, just like reach out to the people that you, that like if you have an interest in something and the college has a club or, you know, a specific program, reach out to those people as much as you can. Um, because even just talking with them, even if they don't end up uh, sending, you know, talking to admissions on your behalf is really helpful. Um, it can really help you decide what route you're going to pursue. Um, so, that's what I'd say. Great. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you to all of you again. Does anyone have a question? Any questions? Dr. Um, you mentioned something about putting together a resume prior to the interview. For the young kids, what would you suggest they put on that resume? But obviously, you know, it's going to be very limited at this point in life. And, and what are you looking for as a good resume? I'm, I'm looking for examples of what you have <coughs> done. Um, what are the sports activities here? One of the people I interviewed here has been uh, out west uh, with the uh, summer program and has been instructing or assisting the instruction for a couple of years. The fact that that was on the resume gave an opening for a nice conversation. I learned a great deal that I never knew before. was very glad to learn. Uh, so it's some of the things which you've done here in school. It's if you've had summer employment. Um, <clears throat> any life experiences you've had, you can, you can go back to junior high school, middle school, if you need to or choose to. But uh, special hobbies and the interests of that nature that will stand out. I would just echo that, you know, in high school, trying to put together a resume it might seem awkward. I, I, maybe you haven't had a summer job. Um, you know, I go to school. What, what, what more do, do you want from me? Um, <laughs> think about any awards or accolades you've, you've gotten. You're student of the Week at CVA, you know? Um, Honor roll, high honors, right? These types of things. So um, the volunteer experience that you've done, you've all done the canned food drive, you've all done the special Olympics here at CBA, um, you've all traveled uh, and competed and done, the, you know, you're a three-season athlete. So um, all of those things would, would contribute to a, a resume for a high school student. Thanks. Anyone else? Questions? I think one more thing that could be on that resume is what is your, quote, career objective? You know, what is, why is it you want to go to college? What is it you like to be doing five or ten years? One of my favorite questions is, if I were to meet you ten years from now, what would you like to be doing? And I can give hints of that on a resume. In the back. Sam, plowing through applications, what are the five essays that you've read recently that kind of are like, oh, that kid who wrote about this, that kid who wrote about that, like that just really stick out? I'm assuming you read a lot about skiing and sports, but like the five that really stick out is, ah, I, I like this essay because I remember it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so by the end of this winter, I will have read over a thousand college entrance essays. Um, and, you know, 250 of them were about a sports injury, having to recover. And that's really boring to read about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so, so the essay, there's really a couple reasons why we use that and why it's important. Uh, and as I said, one is so that we can see that you can write well and have the, the you know, are savvy enough to actually get it edited. You wouldn't, you'd be surprised how many students submit their college essay with grammar mistakes. I mean, that's, that's an easy thing to do, get it edited, have as many people look over as possible. Um, so the, the, the ability to write a, you know, to craft an essay with a beginning, a middle, and end, is there a point? Is there a, a main uh, a thesis that you're, you're presenting? Um, the essays that stick out to me 
are those that show a, a, a certain level of uh, the ability to be reflective and to sort of that sort of show a, uh, a a more mature worldview. Um, so rather than just writing about um, you know a, a, a particular race or competition that was you know you had to work really hard for. Well, that's that's great. That's a nice story. But what what was the lesson learned? Um, what did you what do you know now that you didn't know then? Right. So it, um, trying to show a little bit of depth um, to to your your ability to think. Um, uh, and to show a little bit of an intellectual curiosity. These are sort of uh, abstract ideas, but um, essentially I want to read uh, an essay that, um, that shows some thoughtfulness and some, you know, the ability to, um, to, to, to think critically. Um, so all those things can, can come through in a well-crafted essay. Um, you guys know that. You work on that. It was an English class all the time. Um, but get it edited. Work up, start it early, show it to your English teacher, show it to your parents, show it to your peers, show it to your, your college advisor, get it edited, work on it. Um, and, you know, it's one piece of the puzzle at the end of the day. Of many. I'd say, too, just to add to that, like, if you're getting edits from your parents or your teachers, listen to what they're saying. Um, <laughs> because I know, at least for me, I wrote my first college admissions essay and I was like, yes, like this is great. This is my college admissions essay. My parents were like, uh, no, like this isn't good. And I was like, no, yes it is. Like this is really good. And they were right, ultimately. Um, of course, as parents usually are. Um, and so just like listen to the people giving you feedback as much as you can because they're ultimately, they have the same goals as you do. And they'll really help you out. And I would, I would, sorry, I would just add briefly that um, the vast majority of, of essays I read are fine. They're just fine, average, good. They're, it's solid writing. Okay, on to the next one. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the decision one way or another. But a really bad one is going to affect it. A really good one might make up for other shortcomings in the application. So, you know, a really good one can make a difference. A really bad one can make a difference. But usually, it, it, you know, it's not going to make or break an application. Thank you. So to kind of piggyback off of Honor's question, do you have like one or two in particular, just either from the last year or from your career, that have like really stuck out as like, this is this like amazing A plus, best essay ever, like this is the most interesting one I've ever read or most unique, like what, is there like one or two specifically that have stuck out to you? Just so we can get like a real... Yeah, sure. And, and, and I, I, I'm not going to be able to give you guys like the, the magic topic to write about or anything like that. Um, one that I remember that stood out was a girl from Texas. And uh, her family, her parents were immigrants from uh, Mexico. I don't think they were undocumented immigrants. Well, lo and behold, they won the lottery. They won several million dollars in the lottery. And life went from zero to 60 um, overnight. And life was great, and then they lost it all. Bankruptcy, family fell apart, and they're living in a motel room. Um, so that made for a really compelling, interesting <laughs> story. Um, so go play the Powerball. <laughs> now, you know, that's a, that's a you know, not a, not, not, a, not a universal experience by any means, but um, uh, it, that, that one stuck out in terms of content. You, now, you can't, you also can't make something like that up. Um, but again, it, it's not so much the, um, the, the subject matter, but how you present it, right? Uh, thinking about um, lessons learned, the growth you've experienced in, in high school, um, uh, so an event that really had an impact on you, um, or, or really sort of sh shook your, your whole world for you. Those are the types of things that I think make it really compelling essay. Is there, is there any benefit um, to applying early if you know you want to go to Colby, say, and you're kind of a borderline student? Is there a benefit to saying, yes, I'm going to apply early and 
rather than just being one of the masses sure. later on. So um, early decision is an option uh, that many schools offer for applying. And um, so early decision means that you apply to one school and you're designating it your first choice and you're committing to attending if you get it. Um, so schools like Colby offer early decision in November. Um, you get all your college admission stuff right out of the way, you know you're going to Colby, bam, done. Um, other schools have things called early action, which means you can apply early, uh, find out you're in or out, and you don't have to commit. Other schools have rolling admissions, which means you can apply at any point during the school year and find out you're in. Um, at colleges like Colby, that's a more selective colleges, um, early decision is a lot of oftentimes used for students who they've visited campus, they've determined that it's their number one choice, they definitely want to go there, uh, it's the school for them, they're committing to it. Um, a lot of athletes will go early decision. Um, is there a benefit? Well, or, or is there, is there, does it increase any, your chances or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like if you're a student that, you know, really wants to go there but is not, you know, outstanding, like you, 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 as you're applying, yeah. is there a benefit? Sure, to, well, to, if you think about, at a school like Colby, we took, we take close to 50% of our class through the early decision round. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, of the nearly 10,000 applications we receive, uh, the vast majority of those applications are in the regular decision round. So the acceptance rate is much, much higher in early decision. I mean, you, that, that's no secret. So there's a higher acceptance rate. With that said, it's sort of self-selecting, right? These are students that feel like they have a really good chance of getting in. They wouldn't apply early decision if they didn't think that they, they were a good fit, that they, had, that, they met the, that they were within the profile, that they were within the range of of test scores and grades and things like that. So yes, there's a higher acceptance rate, but the caliber of student, I don't think, I don't really see a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, showing that, you know, it, it can't hurt, if you, if you are a student who's, am I I'm slightly under the profile for this particular college, going to early decision, certainly, um, you know, if you're playing the numbers game, it would, it would make mm -hmm. sense. So you said that uh, sports plays into it that when you're looking at a prospective uh, applicant that the amount of effort that they contribute to their sport plays into your decision. Would their success also play in like if there was someone, like for instance here at CBA there's everyone's an athlete, but there's different levels of success amongst us. So if someone say wins a World Cup or a Moran Well, um, I can tell you that if the applicant, if either of those applicants didn't have the grades and the other things, that, that those wouldn't matter at all. Um, you know, s colleges are looking for students that are going to make an impact and that, uh, on their campus, um, that have those unique qualities and things like that. Um, but, you know, the thing about pursu playing it, pursuing any sport or activity at a high level, um, regardless of the success you achieve, the fact that you've put the effort in, that you've put the work in, um, that you've you know you've challenged yourself, I think that's what what stands out. Um, so yeah, it's cool to say, oh, we've got this many national champions in our freshman class. Um, that that's great to say for marketing purposes. But when we're I'm reviewing an application, um, you know, I, the 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 results really are. are really what stand out. And again, these are the things, we're, we're getting into sort of the secondary and tertiary parts of an application, right? So your extracurriculars aren't going to get you into college. Your, your, your grades and your academic performance are, are going to get you into, you know, into college. The extracurriculars, things you've done outside the classroom, um, all help, you know, shape that, the, the applicant and let us know you know, what the potential impact might be on campus, what, what, what the student brings that's unique, but um, it's not what's going to get you in. Um, if you're
to get waitlisted from your number one college, are there some things that you could do to maybe sway the admission process or the, their opinions? Yeah, so um, students who uh, apply and are not admitted and are, are not denied are sometimes waitlisted, which basically means, you know, you're a, an alternate, sort of. Um, we'll get back to you in the spring when we know how things are shaping up. Um, so it's sort of a, a, an awkward position to be in because you're left, you're kind of left hanging for, throughout the winter. Um, I would, if anyone is on, gets waitlisted at a school they're really interested in uh, enrolling at, I would certainly recommend um, shooting an email to the admissions counselor who is responsible for your region, um, and I, you know, just to update them on how your year's been going, uh, reiterating your interest in the school, um, and letting them know of any uh, changes or updates um, or things that um, you know you think better reflect your, where, where you are as a student at that point. So yeah, I would definitely recommend reaching out. Yeah. How, would, how would they find out that information? Who's their regional? <coughs> yeah, so um, college admissions offices are generally split up uh, based on geography. So uh, whatever colleges you're interested in, there's going to be a certain person who um, is sort of in charge of main applicants um, amongst other places. So on the college website, um, on the admissions page, you could find that person um, and get in touch with that person that way. And at least in the case of Dartmouth, if you've been interviewed by somebody, be back in touch with that person. This is a more subjective view on that too, but um, and it goes back to the whether or not to apply early decision or regular decision. Um, but I know at least in talking to my classmates, um, it seems that like my class and a lot of the classes behind me at Bates, the overwhelming majority of the student body is comprised of people who applied early and people who get on, got in off the wait list. Um, which, I mean, because I know a lot of people get in early, but I've talked to so many people who were, weren't convinced enough to apply early but then waited and then stayed on the wait list and ended up getting let in in June or even July. Any other questions? Um, I have another question. This one's for Dr. Pierce. So what would be some of your tips for students and how do they can best prepare for an interview? One thought is to practice interviews with each other. Or if you can beg a faculty member to take the time, uh, <clears throat> ask questions. See what your classmate thinks of your answer. And just that process can help you, whether it's a college admissions or whether it's a summer job you're looking for at some point. Um, does that respond to you? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Maybe I'll put you on the spot a little bit. In your personal experience, were you rejected from these schools early, and then how? Yeah. So um, I'll go back to that first admissions essay that I wrote and didn't listen to anybody when they told me uh, not to send it into a school. So um, I applied ED1 to Bowdoin and didn't get into Bowdoin. Um, and then applied ED2 to Bates and got into Bates. Um, and also, I was far enough, so I don't know how many other schools do the ED2 process, but basically it was the same deadline as regular decision, but it's binding, um, and you hear about a month and a half before you hear for regular decision. So I heard in early February, um, and yeah, I mean, it ended up um, going back again to the visiting schools and finding a school that there is the right fit for you. I know a lot of students that get rejected from schools probably say this in hindsight, but it really, for me, is very true that the school that I ended up at was a much better fit than the school that I thought that I wanted to go to. And um, I didn't know that until I spent a lot more time with both student bodies, which I have over the past four years. So, 
yeah, definitely visit and do overnight visits if you can, um, because students will really take the time to get to know you and try to convince you to go to their respective schools mm -hmm. since they're really informational. So. And they can be pretty fun too, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, they now they now schedule student visits on mostly Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I believe. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you know someone at the school, that's another great way um, to just go stay with them for a night. And uh, it really, it is very telling in the community aspect of it because even though maybe after graduation, um, you know, I find that I have a lot in common with people who have gone to Colby and um, Bowdoin and Middlebury and all the other small New England colleges. Um, when you're in college, at least from my experience, they're very distinct communities and I have friends at all of those schools so who've had different experiences than I have and I've just found that where I ended up is the was the best fit for me. So something to take into consideration. Any other questions? How about um, I know there's been talk about is A P classes, I guess for, you know, like Colby. How is that viewed the importance of if you take that kind of class or not and how that's used once you get to college? Sure. So um, at Colby as a selective college we want to see we expect to see students that have taken the most demanding curriculum available to them. Um, at CBA, your curriculum is pretty limited, um, and so we don't wouldn't expect to see AP, IB if they're not offered. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have to hold that against you. So whatever the context of your school is, we want to see that you've taken a challenging curriculum. Um, you know, with that said, it, whatever the those classes are are at your school. Um, it, it's important not to pick your classes simply for you know what it's going to look like on your college transcript. Pick a curriculum, pick a, a, a course schedule that you're comfortable with, that you're comfortable, uh, that you feel like you're going to be successful in. Because um, if you have five AP classes and you've got all C's and B minuses, and um, you know, great, you've challenged yourself, but you know we want to see excellence too. Um, so. Would it have been better to take three APs and two regular classes and have you know, three Bs and two As? Probably. Um, so again, if we want to see you taking the most demanding classes that are available to you. It's going to totally depend on the context of your school and what's available. Um, I don't know what the status of CBA AP classes are at the moment, but when I was here, um, none were offered. Um, but a classmate of mine both felt very strongly that we had a particular subject that we were both really invested in and felt like we could, it was bio two, so we're already on a higher level curricular, like curriculum than the bio one curriculum. Um, and we're already prepping for the SAT two course. So we felt that if we had just put in, we put in a little bit more time, we could take the AP bio course. Um, so we talked to, we talked to Karen and we got it set up so that we could take that AP course. And though I, in it, I initially thought in high school that I would pursue bio in college, um, at least to you know some extent, and I didn't end up doing that, but those AP credits that I got from uh, that class ended up giving me way more flexibility in um, my abroad experience, in, choosing which classes to take like while I was at Bates um, in order to pursue different majors. Um, so I would say it, it didn't really make a huge difference in that I was like substituting those credits for a class, but it did make a difference ultimately that I had those extra two credits. Great. Any other questions? I make one other comment sure, to sure. make to this group. <clears throat> you have experience of dealing with classes while you were hither and yon on ski trips. And you can present that as a really positive attribute of independent learning and your ability to manage your time, get assignments in whenever they do, that kind of thing. That's a great marketing tool.
and I'll just close with the, and I meant to talk about it a little bit in the beginning, and I know Julia mentioned it, and I think Dr. Pierce did as well, but, you know, CBA has a very strong alumni network. We may not be, you know, back in Carabasa Valley all the time, but there are alums that have gone to the school that have been to probably almost any college that you want to go to. So I would encourage you to use that. We do have an online database. I'm not sure if you guys have access to it yet or not. But um, you can reach out to myself or anyone here, I'm sure, or talk to Kate O'Halloran. And if you guys, if you're really dead set on going to a school, for example, Middlebury or Bates, and you want to talk to a CBA alum that you know, knows the experience that you've had and pick their brain about how, you know, how, how did they do it, how did they get in, you know, what resources did they use, um, I almost, I would bet you, I, I guarantee you, they'll be happy to take some time to talk to you. And I think it's a great resource that we probably don't take advantage of enough. So I really encourage you guys to do that. Um, again, if, if you want to talk to anybody, get in touch with Kate. She can find me or track somebody down to, uh, to spend 20 minutes or so talking to you. And I think the insight could be you know, invaluable. So with that, unless there's anything else, thank you guys very much for coming. We really appreciate it.